Hello. Uh, thanks for coming. Welcome to my talk uh, about beta CTAD for C++20. So um, I started doing this thing last year where on the title uh, slide of every one of my talks, I put like another astronomical uh, picture. So for this one, I chose, you know who, what that is? It's a moon. It's, no, it's Pluto. And that's Pluto. And Pluto, uh, why did I choose Pluto for this? Is because Pluto, you know, he's the god of the underworld. Um, it's a thankless job in a way. And then also, you know, the International Astronomical Union, they don't like Pluto very much. So they demoted it. Um, and I think, I think this is kind of really unfair because if you look closely, you know, it's really, Pluto is really nice. He has like a little heart in here, right? See it? So I think, um, so with CTAD, I think it's a bit similar because um, so last year at CPPCon, uh, we had this, um, there was this Grill the Committee um, session. And uh, one of the questions that was asked there was um, uh, to those uh, people on stage of whom at least one of them is in the room right now. Um, <coughs> like if you had a magic wand and could go back in time and remove one feature from C++, which one would it be? And two people said, CTAD, and that was the first one that was mentioned. So apparently, and David also said in his keynote uh, yesterday that he doesn't like CTAD. So apparently, um, CTAD, like C++ experts don't like CTAD very much, or like a lot of them. And um, I can sort of see why, but I think it's, it's, it's unfair, really, because, you know, what, you know, what does CTAD do? So obviously, uh, you know, let's start the talk with the Tony table, you know, uh, you, know, you have a vector int, and with CTAD, you don't have to write the obvious argument because they're ints, you don't have to write the ints. For the array, you know, you actually don't have to write either int or three because why should you? It's like the, the initializer is literally three ints, so why do you have to repeat int and three? So it lets you write code faster, cleaner, shorter, and I think that's a good thing. So sometimes it's just like very long names and you don't have to write them out. Sometimes it's actually more interesting, like for example, if you have a set and you want to give it a custom compar comparator and then you want to use a lambda, in C++14, there's different ways of doing it, but they're all kind of ugly. So um, you kind of have to uh, put the type of the lambda in there and then you have to pass uh, uh, an instance in. And then I think in C++20, you don't have to do the latter part because lambdas are now default constructible, but it's still going to be long, but with CTAD, you just give it like the initializer list and the lambda, and it's just going to figure out the types. So that's just a lot more elegant, I think. And then um, obviously the types uh, which uh, benefit, I think, the most from CTAD are parent tuple, especially tuple. It's pronounced tuple, by the way, not tuple. Um, so um, where you really want to have a template argument deduction, because you know tuples arguments can there can be lots of them. So Ever since C++11, you know, we had to have a way to do this, um, but uh, because we didn't have CTAD, we only had function template argument deduction, which we had since the 90s. So there was this way with the make functions to do it. So you leverage the function template argument deduction to deduce uh, the, the template arguments for you, and then you use auto, so you don't have to write them on the left side. But I think really, I mean, now we can write it this way, and I think this is what people wanted to write in the first place. And I think really this make function uh, thing is really kind of a hack in a way. Like you kind of use function template argument deduction, but you don't really need a function except to deduce the arguments. I mean, there are a few use cases where actually the make functions are still useful, but I think I see them as a hack and I'm happy that we don't have to do that anymore. And, and um, so, you know, when C++ experts say they don't like CTAD because like under the hood, it's quite complex what's going on then I would point them to this and say 98% of all C++ stuff developers, they're going to, this is the only way they're gonna ever interact with CTAD, right? They're gonna write, uh, uh, you're gonna use STL classes and they're gonna just not have to write out these template arguments and in most of these cases, it's pretty obvious what's going on. So the vast majority of the time is gonna save people typing and that's a good thing. And so for most people, it's, it's a good thing. So I would kind of say, you know, CTAD does get a lot of, bad reputation from experts uh, unnecessarily, in my opinion. So, but I'm not gonna talk in this talk about, um, whew, sorry, I think because of the altitude and I talk so much, I get out of breath, so whew, I need to talk a bit slower. Sorry for that. 
Okay, so this is library stuff. In this talk, we're not going to talk about library stuff. So I gave another talk about CTAD uh, last year at CPPCon, which is this one, where I talk about a lot of the STL, how you use CTAD with the STL, how the deduction guides in the STL work. If you're a library author yourself, how would you write deduction guides? Or like if you know you have a library with template classes and then your users switch to C17, and all of a sudden, you know, they have all these different new ways of initializing your classes. So maybe as a library author, you should go back and revisit that. Um, so that's this talk. In this talk, however, right here, we're not going to talk about any library stuff. This is just about the core language uh, feature. And uh, it's going to be three parts. The first part is literally uh, basically this part of the standard, which is how CTAD works today in C17. And we're going to spend a fair amount of time just explaining the core language machinery, how CTAD works exactly. I'm going to spend a lot of time on that uh, because it's like important for the rest that we're kind of all on the same page, how exactly this feature works. And then I think after this section, you're all going to be able to understand exactly what's going on there under the hood. Then the second part of the talk um, will be um, this paper, uh, of which I'm one of the authors, uh, which is basically CTAD for C++20. So it's not in the C++20 draft yet, uh, because uh, we discussed this uh, in Kona a couple of months ago, and um, there are still some things where the wording isn't quite right yet. So we still have to polish the wording a little bit, but um, I'm going to talk about the challenges there as well. Um, but I think at this point it's fairly safe to say I think I'm pretty sure that we're going to be able to fix that and hopefully vote this in in Cologne in July. So I would be very surprised if this would not end up in C++20 uh, in Cologne. So I think really what we're looking at here is this is what CTAD's going to look like in C++20. And what it really is is kind of an extension of what we had in 17. So 17. In 17, the feature was merged into the standard quite late in the release cycle, and it was kind of incomplete in a way, and, and this paper basically plugs a few of the holes um, and, and makes it a bit more usable. So, um, so this is kind of the other big section of this talk. We're going to talk about this. And then the last section of this talk is what I call the uh, unicorns and traps section, which is basically uh, unicorns are you know these things that we wish we would have because it would be awesome, but we don't have them, and we won't get them in 20, and we probably won't, won't never get them. And then also some traps, basically where something, you have an expectation how something should behave, and then it behaves in a different way, and that hurts. And then actually the whole point is that sometimes unicorns and traps are actually the same thing, right? So you want a unicorn, but if you would get it, it would actually be a trap. So yeah, so we're going to talk about that. Um, but the first section, as I said, is how does CTAD exactly work, like the language, core language machinery. So we're going to take that apart. Uh, first um, question is, you know, when does CTAD actually happen? Um, and um, obviously, if you have something like this, um, C you're going to get CTAD. And it's a very simple rule, which is going to be important again and again throughout this talk, is uh, if you have a template name with no angry brackets at all, like no template argument list, in an init declaration like this, then this is a placeholder, and then you're going to get CTAD. And um, so again, template name, no template arguments. Init declaration is a placeholder. It's not the only placeholder we have in the language. What other placeholders do we have? Placeholders. The well, we have auto and decal type auto, right? These are the other placeholders. And then in C++20, we're going to also get concept auto. Um, so, so they're similar in a way that, you know, it's not a type, it's a placeholder. But then the placeholder tells you, well, we have to deduce the type. And then through this, some kind of machinery, the type is deduced. And then what happens is that you have the type, and then you replace the placeholder with the actual type. And then you evaluate the thing. And this is the same mechanism for auto. Like, what happens actually is different, but you know, the same idea that you have a placeholder, which means you're going to deduce something, and then you're going to replace the result, the placeholder with the result, like the type that you have. And this is exactly what happens in CTAD. Uh, the difference is between CTAD and auto is the way this deduction happens. So what does CTAD do? Um, basically, whenever you have this placeholder, which is a template name with no angry brackets, it's going to synthesize a bunch of function templates, and then it's going to, uh, because this is uh, how we know how to do template argument deduction, right? It functions. This has worked since the 90s. 
So what CTAD actually does, it, it kind of uses the same machinery. It synthesizes a bunch of functions that don't actually exist. And then it's going to do function template argument deduction and overload resolution on them. And then that's, the result of that is going to be some type that is deduced. And then the placeholder is replaced with that type. So this is what CTAD is. Um, so what is the set of synthesized function templates? So it's this uh, overload set of um, deduction candidates. And these are functions that don't exist. They're made up uh, by your compiler. Uh, and the compiler synthesizes them from four different sources. So it synthesizes a bunch of functions from constructors. It synthesizes a bunch of functions from deduction guides, if you have them. And then it synthesizes this uh, default candidate under certain conditions, and then it synthesizes the copy deduction candidate. Uh, we're going to talk about all of these. Um, so it, it has these four places from which it, it takes some information and then makes up some functions that don't actually exist and then throws them into an overload set, does template argument deduction and overload resolution on them, and then if the result is a type, that's going to be uh, put into the placeholder. So constructors. Uh, this is one source of functions. Let's look at this. Uh, type here. This is not actually std pair the way it, it works in the standard library. It's like a very, very much simpler, simpler class. Um, so it, it basically, it's a template. It has some template parameters and it has, uh, it has two uh, constructors. Uh, yeah, it doesn't really matter. It's just, the point is it's a template and has some constructor. And then uh, you want to initialize it like this and you don't write any angry brackets, which means, hey, we're going to do ctab. So uh, it's going to look at constructors, right? That's the first of the four places where it takes functions from. So it's going to look at the constructors. We have these two constructors. It's just going to look at the signature. It doesn't matter, like the members, the, the body of that, doesn't matter. Right, so we want to use these constructors to uh, synthesize these functions. So the way it works is, um, so because you want to use uh, function template argument deduction, this is something that works in function templates. So the, the functions that actually the thing that is getting synthesized, I'm sorry, it's not functions, it's function templates. So I was incorrect there. Function templates are not functions, they're function templates. So we're synthesizing a bunch of function templates and we're going to synthesize one from each constructor. And the way it works is it's going to take the template arguments of the class and it's going to pretend that these are the template arguments of these, of these functions. So it's going to take the constructors and the template arguments of the class and it's going to stick them in there. So now already we have some function templates that don't actually exist in real life. So, um, so we have these, temp these um, function templates and they're missing a return type. So let's add a return type and that's going to be just the, um, the, the template itself with the template arguments that it has. And then uh, this is our overload set from constructors. So we have these two functions. And then what this is going to do, it's going to take uh, the initializer that you wrote and it's going to do template argument deduction and overload resolution on this set of functions. The same way that template argument deduction and overload resolution works since the 90s, with a few extra rules for some corner cases. But basically, it's the same thing. It's template argument deduction and overload resolution, the way it works in C++ 98, on these functions. And then uh, there's one gotcha here, which is something that um, is very confusing, even to experts. Um, is that if you look at this thing where you have template type t, t ref ref, this looks like a forwarding reference, right? But in this case, these are not forwarding references. It took me a while to figure out why, actually I couldn't figure it out. I was looking at the wording, I was like, why are these not forwarding references? And then I found Richard Smith and he said, well, yeah, yeah, so on this other, you have to look where uh, the standard defines what a forwarding reference is. And there it says, this is what a forwarding reference is, except while you're doing CTAD. So what, during CTAD, <laughs> these are not forwarding references. So this is really confusing, really important to remember. Yes, so Ben. I, I ran into the same thing, and I found there was actually a national body comment on that very sort of deep defect, as it were. But, but yeah, you're absolutely right, of course. So should I, should I repeat the? Yeah. So the comment was um, that um, this was actually put in later because it was a national body comment that this was a defect, that they forgot to do this, right? Well, it, at least it was very unclear. Oh, it wasn't it clear. Was so it was very unclear to me when I was, I, I gave the, I think, was it ACCU last year, I think? And like Louis was in the room and a bunch of committee pe other committee people and we were staring at this all together in a group and we were like, 
we don't understand why these are not forwarding references. And then we found Richard Smith and he was like, yeah, yeah, it's this sentence. So you said it was actually added later as a defect kind of re well, resolution. I, I had the same confusion. Yeah. I, I don't know, he did, I think I talked to Stefan about it. Okay. And um, somebody told me I wanted to look for that. Okay, so this is very confusing, even to experts. Um, I certainly was not able to figure this out on my own. These are not forwarding references, very important. Well, no, it would not be useful if they were, because in this case, then you would, um, you would have an um, ambiguity, right? Because if, if this were a forwarding reference, then you would have an L value down there, then both of them would match, and then like deduction would fail. So, so they would do something different from the, yeah. the constructors. If reference is always in. I think it would be even worse than that. You wouldn't get ambiguity, you'd just get wrong. OK, so the, the <laughs> comment was, you wouldn't get ambiguity, you would just get the wrong. You would you would call the wrong function basically during overload. You would select the wrong function during overload resolution. Yes, so another comment? Uh, just a question. Yeah. So like, you, you said this is the same since the 90s, but reducing R value references is not something, this is new, right? Okay, so it's not exactly the same since the 90s. What I was trying to say is, so we synthesize these functions, and then we are going to do overload resolution and template argument deduction on them as if they were just functions, except that they don't actually exist. The compiler made them up. Okay. But the rules are, you know, we pretend these functions exist, and then we perform overload resolution and template argument deduction on them with the usual rules. But what I'm saying is the usual, this, there's a new rule that needs to be accounted for because of the R value reference. Thing. Well, there is a new, which is why I'm pointing this out. There is this one exception, and there's another exception which says, you know, we're going to come to that. There's a few other exceptions, a few other small extra rules, but 98% of it is, is just the way old resolution template argument deduction works, just applied to these synthesized functions. Okay. Right, so if, after we have done all that, you know, old resolution will select a winning candidate, which is this one, and then template argument deduction on this function will succeed and will deduce pair and bool. Right? This is just function argument deduction. And then what will happen is um, this deduced concrete type will be put inside where the, so the placeholder, which is just the pair, will be replaced by this actual type. So what's going to happen is this is going to go down there. So now we replace the placeholder with the actual type. And then we're done. CTED is over. Everything, pff, these synthesized functions go away, we're done. So the only thing we did was we replaced the placeholder with this type that we deduced. We're done here. Now, um, actually instantiating this template and actually initializing this object is the next step, which is, yes? If we explicitly specify the template arguments, does the compile faster? The question was if we explicitly specify the template arguments, does it compile faster? And of course, yes, because you don't have to do any of the stuff. So from, from the compilation speed point of view, it is recommended to explicitly specify those. Well, I mean, I would measure, like, if that becomes a problem, like, with everything that <coughs> takes time, like, if it becomes a problem, I don't see how it would become a problem, because the compiler does a lot of stuff which takes a lot longer than any of this. So, I mean, I, like, it would be highly unlikely that this is your bottleneck. But yes, it takes longer than not having to do that, of course, yes. Um, anyway, so the, the, the other really confusing thing about CTAT is that CTAT is over here, and this, like actually doing the, evaluating this declaration is the next step. And this can still actually call another constructor now, not the one that we used, and this can actually still fail. Right? This is like a, a step two. This has nothing to do with CTAT anymore. CTAT just gives you the type, and then you're going to do whatever you would be doing if that was written. And, and this can still do something else. But this is independent. So CTAD is like this one step, and actually initializing the object is a separate step which comes afterwards. That's really, really important. That also confused me for a very, very long time. Yes, there is another comment. Um, so for the synthesized functions, is it only used for deduction of the types? Like, why is the R value reference case necessary? Wouldn't this cost ref version be enough to get the correct P and B? Like, what case do they differ? If you have L value references, you want, you want to use the oh. same constructor for deduction 
well, most of the time that you would have selected if it were not, uh, if you wouldn't oh, have to do this. So, so, so if it were not a template, those wouldn't be forwarding references. So, so if, if you were to write out the template arguments, you wouldn't deduce things, so you wouldn't, so the ref ref wouldn't be, hang on. Okay, so shall we take this offline because this is this is a longer discussion, I think. So there is there this rule is there because otherwise you would sometimes not deduce the right thing. Yes. Basically, that's the short answer. Like let's discuss the details later because uh, we only have 90 minutes in total. Um, so so anyway, so this can still fail or do something else, and this is really important. So um, this is an example. What's this going to do? This is not going to compile, right? Because you're calling a private constructor. But what's going to be the error message? This is kind of the check whether you um, you understand what's going on. Uh, yes, the constructor of uh, what? The construct of widget? Mm. Widget int. That's thing. So CTAD does not call anything, right? It doesn't call any function. It doesn't care about private or whatever. It just does this overload resolution thing. And it, it, it doesn't care about private because it's not going to call it. Um, so it's going to deduce widget int. It's going to succeed. These synthesized functions will go away, and then we're going to evaluate widget int, widget int w zero, and then that's going to fail because we're calling a private constructor. But that's like a separate step. So private constructors are part of the synthesized uh, overload set. Yes, private constructors are part of the synthesized overload set because CTAD doesn't care about private because it's not going to call them. Private means you cannot call them. CTAD is not calling anything, so it doesn't care. Yes. Well, you can, if it's finite out, then it's not part of the uh, overload resolution set, right? So you, let's say you had a static that doesn't the body of the constructor? The body is not considered using CTAD. It's not calling the function. Okay. It's, it's just looking at the signature and does, it's doing overload resolution and template argument reduction. If you have something in the body, it doesn't care. It never looks at the body. You don't even have to have a body. All right, uh, here's another example. What does this do? Ah, so this is the next uh, really important thing to remember. So first important thing to remember, you only get seated if you don't have angry brackets. Second thing to remember is it, the actual initialization is a separate step. The third thing to remember, CTAD only considers the primary template. So these are the three really important things. CTAD never looks at any specialization. It just completely ignores them. So if you have this, it's going to look at the primary template. And then the primary template doesn't have any constructors, so there's nothing to deduce from, so this is going to fail. Even though we have a specialization down there that has the right constructor, right? But CTAD is not going to look into that. CTAD only ever looks at the primary template. That's the third really, really important rule to remember. And um, there's another interesting case, which is this. What does this do? So now we have a constructor in the primary template. And then in the specialization, we have, we have a different one. So CTAT will go for the first one. That's correct. So CTAT will deduce widget int. What's going to happen then? It's going to try to call. So now it's done, right? We have widget int. CTAT goes away. And now it sees the specialization. And now it says, well, her int double conversion, but also it's like an R value and an L value reference. So that's actually going to fail. So CTAT's successful, but then it goes into the specialization, and then, right. So that's what's going to happen here. Yes? So does the, uh, the primary template rule uh, only apply, or does it still apply if you have deduction hits? Yes. The primary template rule, like CTAT will not look, look into any specializations ever. Deduction guides are independent from whether you have specializations or even Deduction guides are just looking at the template name and then match. Sure, sure, so we're going to look at deduction guides in a minute. Okay. So we're going to go through all the rules, like how everything works. So maybe your question is going to be answered by that. So uh, another thing that confused me uh, because I didn't understand how it worked, but um, what happens if the constructor itself has template arguments? Anyone knows? So I thought for a while this was not really useful. But actually, it is. Uh, so there's quite a few uh, classes in the, in the standard library that have these templated constructors, like pair and tuple and, and the smart pointers and a bunch of them. So what happens in this case 
So as I said, it's going to move the, um, it's going, for the synthesized function, it's going to move the template arguments to the constructor. But if the constructor itself has template arguments, it's just going to concatenate them like this. So this is going to be the synthesized function. And then uh, the return type will still be the, uh, the one with the templates uh, parameters just from the class itself. And then that's going to do the usual thing, template argument reduction over resolution. It's going to succeed. Um, and then uh, you get you get your, your result. Okay, so that's that's uh, how CTED what CTED, how CTED synthesizes these functions from constructors. Any questions about this part? Okay, cool. So then we have the second part from deduction guides, and this is a lot simpler. So let's say we have um, um, vector, for example, um, this is not, again, the actual vector because the actual vector also has an allocator in it. I'm going to ignore the allocator. Um, so vector, if you ignore the allocator, has this kind of deduction guide, which is really useful because um, then you can do this. You can give it like a range of, you can give it like a pair of iterators to int. doesn't matter what kind of iterators. They only have to be uh, um, input iterators. And then it's going to deduce the type of the, the actual element type from the iterators by unwrapping the iterator type and then, so this is not something that the compiler would be able to do on, on its own. This is why you have this guide where it says, okay, if you have like a, uh, you know, iterators, um, then unwrap the iterators and use the value type for the, for the template argument for the vector. Um, so, and then what CTAD is going to do here is it's going to just look at this as if it were a function. It's going to synthesize the function from this guide, which is literally just the parameters as you wrote them and the return type as you wrote them. I mean, this almost already looks like a function. So it's going to synthesize a function which has these, takes these parameters, uh, these template parameters, these uh, arguments, and then this return type. And it's going to synthesize a function from this guide, and it's going to throw that into the overload set together with the constructor synthesizer functions. That, that's, what it, that's how these guides work. And then this is going to deduce the type, uh, and, then, and then we're done, and this is, this is how everything works, and this is fine. Um, Trap here is that it depends on the order. If you put the deduction guide below, it's not going to see it, so the order matters. Um, let's put it up there again. Um, so um, another thing that's important. So it's going to do this, use this guide and, and treat it as a function and throw this into the overload set uh, and then deduce the type. But then it will still, after that, independently from that, when that's done, you know, when, when you know the type, it's going to actually initialize it. So um, what happens if we uh, replace the uh, parents with the curly braces? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. So if you've been to my uh, initialization talk, I had like lots of these examples. So um, basically, for, for CTAD, it doesn't matter, right? Because it's the same overload set. Um, so it's going to, um, but then um, basically, no, actually it does. Because um, if you have curlies, the way initialization works is uh, that if you have curlies, um, then if you have an initializerless constructor, that's always going to win, right? Mm -hmm. If you can possibly somehow uh, call initializerless constructor with this, then this is what's going to happen. And because this is just overload resolution, and CTAT is also just overload resolution, it's the same rules apply. So this thing will, will call the, um, the initializer list constructor, and uh, it, it will not call it, I'm sorry. It will, the initializer list constructor will win for the overload resolution during CTAD. So what you're gonna get is you're gonna get this. You're gonna get a vector with, so it's going to use this type. Yeah, everyone sees why that is the case? Not a lot of ranges so it takes do. all the constructors of vector and it takes this deduction guide and it's gonna throw them all into this overload set and it's gonna, and then CTAD is gonna decide which one is going to win based on the initializer. But because the initializer has curlies, the initializer list constructor is going to win. So CETA is going to use the initializer list constructor. And then the initializer list constructor just says, okay, T is the element type of whatever is in the brace init list. So you're going to get a vector of iterators, which is probably not what you want. But this falls out of the normal overall resolution rules. This is just because CETA works the way it does. Yes? Is it usually good combination? So the question is what happens if you put an equals and the answer is the same thing because this is list, uh, 
direct list initialization equals as copy list initialization, both of them will call the initializer list constructor. So it wouldn't change anything. Well, this is kind of, uh, I do that personally, yes, but it has nothing to do with CTEL. Oh, okay. Yes, personally, I, I prefer to write the equals, but I know that other people have other guidelines. Um, the solution is to make R.N a different type, and this never happens. Hmm? Make R.N a different type, and this never happens, right? Yes. Well, then you won't have to oh, that. All right, let's, <laughs> let's move on. Um, so we have this deduction guide. Um, note that it's just, if you look at it, it's just a, um, it has a template uh, 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 parameter and then it just takes two arguments of that type. So it will match anything where you give it like two, two arguments of the same type. So for example, if you construct a vector with two integers, it's going to, it would match that if you would write it like this, which is why in the standard, uh, there are, uh, there's this wording saying, well, this deduction guide only participates in overlap resolution if, the, if iter is actually in, an input iterator, right? So this is why we need this extra rule. But if you're a library implementer, then how do you implement that? You implement that with Sfine because it's just overlap resolution. So we can use Sfine. So you would Sfine this out and um, you would write something like this. Um, so this is actually how you implement these deduction guides. Um, yes, comment. Yes, so I learned two days ago that in C20 you will actually be able to use uh, uh, concepts in there as well. So it was not obvious for me, again, like just staring at the wording, it was not obvious for me that you could do that. And then I actually wrote like an email a couple days ago to the committee reflector, like, have you overlooked this? Like, I don't see how, like, can we, like, I don't see in the wording that, it's, because the wording for CTAT never ever says anywhere you can use concept or requires or any of this stuff. And then there was a little bit of discussion and then um, basically the consensus was it kind of falls out of the concept wording and the grammar because it, it kind of works. So yes, the answer is, um, um, first of all, you will be able to use concepts to write deduction guides, so you don't have to use enable if in there. And, and also the other thing is because of concepts, you will not need some of the deduction guides, you will not even need the guides anymore because you can express the constraints with just directly with concepts. So this is nice, but it's not obvious from just staring at the, at the standard that this is the case, which is why I'm um, pointing it out now. So yes, you will be able to do that in 20. But in the previous case, when you have the greater trait and it fails, yes. for the type, wouldn't that be enabled already? No. no? Okay. So if you would implement this guide like this, just like this, mm -hmm. um, again, like the actual vector also has allocator in it. Let's ignore that. Yeah. But if you would implement it like this, it's just overlap resolution. So it would, it would um, basically match overlap resolution would match this thing, and then it would it would deduce this type. It's not instantiating anything. It's not uh, it's not doing anything. It's just deducing. So CTED would deduce this type, and then it's done. It's succeeded. And then it would the placeholder would be replaced with this type, and then the next step is after CTED. CTED is over. The next step is you try to instantiate this, and this is where you get the error. So you put two doubles there, then you would deduce some kind of neutral iterated trait double. Well, you would deduce iterated traits double value type, and then see that is done, see that succeeded, and, and then you try to instantiate this, and then it blows up, okay. which is why you need this right. to sphene it out. But, so uh, I'm missing something probably. Yeah. Is the number of traits of int both one? Yes. That's the, the, the thing, right? It, it, it Iterated traits of int is well formed? Yes, it's an empty struct. Yeah, because if you but it doesn't have value type. It does not have value type. Which is why it would blow up. Mm -hmm. But then why, why does the second one work? It's the same principle. Yes, right? exactly. exactly. It would be all virtual, but they would be instantiated later. No, no, no. So, so, so this says if it's, not, uh, uh, an iterate, if it's not an input iterator, then just sphene out the whole thing. Oh, that is a good question. Let's let's look at this in more detail. Marshall, do you know this? What? So why do you why why do we have to, why if it's it's fine if you do this, but why? So so if you sphene it out, it's fine. But if you if you would just have just write this. I think it's 
why, why, why would it not work? Hmm. Okay, so I, I don't know the answer off the top of my head. It doesn't seem like anyone else in the room does. So let's let's figure it out after the talk. And and thanks. So yeah, the, uh, learning something here. Okay, so um, we have we still have these two other things. Um, so you don't only synthesize functions from constructors and deduction guys, but you also have these two. And and what are they? So they say, well, so for a primary class template C, which is just you know, the thing, uh, it adds this um, default constructor kind of function if the C is not defined or if it doesn't have any constructors. And also it does this thing that kind of looks like a copy constructor. And when I, was, when I saw this, this stuff, I was um, literally uh, like implementing uh, CTAD in a C++ front end and I was like, I need to figure this out. Like, what does this mean? Like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, first of all, why would you want to do any of this if C is not even if the template is not defined? Mm -hmm. That doesn't make any sense. And then, if if you have like a, a deduction guide function that doesn't take any arguments, well, if it doesn't take any arguments, how can it ever do any template argument deduction? That doesn't make any sense either. So that really confused me, and and I had to sit down and figure it out. And it turned out it's actually super useful, both of them. So let's let's look at this first. So this is why this uh, is why this works, right? So what you want to do is if you have uh, a template, no constructors, and it has a default template argument. In C++ 14, you have to write less angle angle. With CTED, you don't have to write angle angle anymore. You can just write less. That's useful. That's cool. But less has no constructors and no deduction guides. So how how does this work? And it works because of this default candidate, which means that if, if it doesn't have any constructors, you're going to synthesize this one additional guide, which is the default constructor candidate, which doesn't take any arguments at all, but it still takes the template arguments from the, from the template. And then, you know, if that has a, a default template argument, it's going to use that. So just, you know, if you look at this guy and just run through your head, like the algorithm that I described earlier, like the machinery, then you will see that the result of that will be Less void. Yes. I'm assuming this is just Schleidler, and actually you need a, a definition of what less does. You can't just have a, a forward declaration. Uh, yes. So um, for CTAD, you don't need a definition of the primary template for right. CTAD. Then you're declaring a variable there. Yes. So. The CTAD works. The, the CTAD works. The, the, the actual declaration of the variable doesn't. The actual yes. Okay. So for the actual declaration of the value variable, you need you need a specialization or the yeah. primary template, either of the two. Mm -hmm. okay. In this case, you will at least need the void implementation. You will. In this case, you will at least need the void implementation to be able to initialize it like this. Yes, that's correct. But the important thing is that you get this additional candidate, mm -hmm. which allows you to do this in this case. And the last one is. The uh, this this copy copy deduction candidate, um, and and this is needed again if you have a template and it has no constructors, no deduction guides. You want this to work, right? So if you have a widget int, and then you just do a, you just copy initialize one widget with the other widget. You want to you want it to deduce the same type again, okay. right? So this this just calls the copy constructor or the move constructor, depending on what you're doing. Um, and you want, this to, you want CTAD to work with this. And for this, you need this, this extra guide here. And this covers both move constructor and copy constructor, right? So it's not taking a reference or a ref ref or anything like that. It just takes it by value. So it matches everything. But it doesn't matter because it will never ever call it. So it doesn't matter if it's movable or copyable or any of that stuff. It's not going to call it. It's just using it for deduction. But because you get this one extra candidate, this works. So you get always this candidate which takes the, um, like the same type just by value as the one argument. And then it's going to be able to deduce this whenever you have like a, something like a copy constructor or move constructor call. Yes? Uh, if you write a deduction guide by your own, uh, use a defined and a specified reference, <coughs> is it a forwarding reference or other reference in this case? 
So um, I'm not sure if I understand your question correctly. So if you have a copy constructor and a move no, constructor. No, no. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm asking about the previous slides because uh, uh, when you uh, show uh, the deduction guide for vector, and yes. there are two arguments, two parameters. If, yes. Uh, if you write something like this and uh, uh, use write, uh, for example, iter red red. Yes. Is it going to be forwardly referenced in this case or hardwardly referenced? In, the, in this case, when you make user defined uh, deduction guide. Because Why would you do that? So the point is, um, I think yes, but the answer is this is bad practice. You would not do that because so yeah, yeah, so, so you ne you never deduction guide is not something you ever call. So you don't care about ref 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 movable, copyable, you just want to be able to deduce the right type. And the way to do this is to do this like this, where you don't have any references at all, which means this is always going to match the thing, regardless of what value category it is, and it's always going to deduce it right. Well, uh, and and this, be, this is why, why this is the right way to do it. I was, was just trying to understand uh, if uh, the user-defined deduction guides uh, uh, work uh, the same way as uh, generated automatically. Because you uh, talked about uh, around your reference uh, in the case uh, when the deduction guide is generated. And then trying to understand uh, if... Uh, so you're asking what happens if you write a user-defined deduction guide that takes a tref ref? Yeah. Whether that would match an L value or not yeah, yeah. during CTAD over resolution. That's right. And that's a very interesting question. Um, let's... That's, I, th I think yes, but I'm not 100% sure, so let's check it afterwards. So yes, or yes, forwarding reference? I think it would, in this case, be a forwarding reference. Yes. So, so this rule that it's not a forwarding reference, where was it? So uh, hang, hang on, let me... So, so I think we can figure this out. Where was the slide that... It's n the pair, right? the pair be before the pair one. Before so pair. the pair one. Pair right. So we have e yes. So these are not forwarding references if the template uh, parameters came from the class. In your case, the forwarding references are part of the deduction guide itself. So in this case, I'm pretty sure they would be forwarding references because it's just the usual rules. Okay. So this exception applies if you do this thing where you synthesize the functions by taking the um, template arguments from the class and putting them here in, in, on, on the function that you synthesize. In this case, they're not forwarding references. Okay. In the case you're describing, I'm pretty sure they are. Thank you. Yes, um, let's, let's, I mean, let's check it later with Compile Explorer, but it would be very surprising if it wouldn't be that way. There is the second thing I was going to uh, say. Uh, I just checked CTP reference and it doesn't uh, tell anything about enable if in the deduction guide for vector. Yes, correct. The wording in the standard says, well, this is a deduction guide for vector, but then it does not participate in overload resolution. So it does, it only participates in overload resolution if the type is an iterator, blah, 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 blah. And this occurs, th occurs throughout the, the whole standard library. Like, for example, the, the one for array, like std array has a deduction guide. And then you have this thing where if you give the std array different types in the brace init list, you want deduction to fail because it should behave the same way as, an, as a C array. And then the wording says, does not participate in overload resolution un unless, you know, these are all the same type. But this is not part of the deduction uh, guide that you see on CPP reference, but if you look into the standard library implementation, that's going to have the enable if on it. So then array will have this kind of enable if is same fold expression, like this kind of cool cool hack to do what the wording says. So so yeah, the wording only says doesn't participate in over resolution until this unless this condition holds. The actual library has to implement that by sphenaing out based on this condition. Okay. Yeah, let me, let me skip. So we were at the copy deduction candidate, I think. Yeah, so you were just saying that like for this case, this is the way to write it. If 
if you were to write the same thing for the eight pointer, wouldn't you actually need the ref ref because the dilemma resolution wouldn't actually collect the copy case entries? Or it would Yes, but for unique pointer you don't want so for unique pointer you want to actually make sure that you don't have a deduction guide because otherwise smart pointers are, are a different topic. You don't want smart pointers to do CTAD because if you give them a pointer, well, the pointer cool. decays, so you can't tell whether it's an array or a pointer, and then you would give if you would give it an array, it would deduce the pointer thing and then it would crash when you delete but it. So you don't do that with, with smart let's pointers. Let's, let's talk about move only types then. Okay, let's talk about move only types. Move only yes. Types. Well, you just want this to match during overload resolution, so you don't have to do any of the stuff for move only types, right? Oh, oh no, hang on. You say, you say well, so move, move only, okay. I have a move only of int. So move only of int. And I say move only of int. Yeah. So the copy would be deleted because that's what you saw the constructor. It does not call it ever. It doesn't matter. It just cares about the type. It cares about the type that would, would come out. Right? It doesn't care about whether you can actually call it. It's a bit li it's like, okay. it's like something like decalval, I think, it does the same thing, right? You can put a function in there that you would not actually be able to call, mm -hmm. but it's still going to figure out what the return type of the function would be if you would be able to call it. And okay. this is more or less what happens here as well. Okay. Does right. that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Um, right, so, okay, now I'm, I don't remember where we were. Um, Yes, so the copy deduction candidate. Right, so you, you always get this additional copy deduction candidate. And, and this creates a problem in, in one particular case, which is the tuple case, which is, of course, our favorite library type. Yeah. Um, so what happens here? So tuple actually has um, like a proper copy constructor and a move constructor and all that. The copy deduction candidate actually always wins during overload resolution in this case. So there's like a rule that says just use the copy deduction, like the copy deduction candidate always wins, basically. So it's going to use the copy deduction candidate here, which is great because if you have a tuple, so the first tuple is just going to deduce the, um, the type using like something like this constructor as a guide. The second one is using this copy deduction candidate that we just talked about. So it's also going to use the deduce the same type. So it's going to do the right thing. But, but now what happens if you do this? So now this does not use the copy deduction candidate because it has two parameters. So it's going to match this constructor here. Um, and then it's going to use that for CTED. So now you have a tuple of int if you give it one tuple and a tuple of tuple of int, tuple of int if you give it two tuples. So just by changing the number of arguments, you're changing the type that's being deduced. Right? That's just a consequence of how this copy deduction candidate works. And so you're changing the type anyway to tuple then tuple. Yeah. In this case, you get an extra layer of tuples. Exactly. So, so yeah, thank you, Marshall. The point was it's not about the number of, so you get a different type anyway. So the point is not that. The point is that you get the extra tuple. So basically the rule here is that this copy deduction candidate wins over this constructor because the copy deduction candidate has a higher precedence during overall resolution. And this is why this happens. So this is important to keep this in mind. Uh, I mean, you already have like quite a lot of functions in this overload set. If you throw in another deduction guide in there. Uh, oh, you're, you're asking whether you could fix this by adding yet another deduction guide. I think this is a question for Marshall. I don't know. But. Uh, there are a lot of deduction guides for people already. And a lot of constructors. A lot of, well, we call them implicit deduction guides, mm. which are ones that the compiler generates. And explicit deduction guides yeah. are the one that the library writes. And between the two of them, there are a lot of them. Yeah. So I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah. Uh, Victoria? So if you write a basic um, inconsistency with make tuple, right? This is an inconsistency with make tuple. That is correct. So what is the rationale for having the inconsistency? I, think, I don't think there was a rationale. I don't know. Like, I, when I you know, started going to committee meetings, the wording for CTAD, the language feature was already done. So I don't know how this the process of how this wording came about. But from what I can piece together, like my, my guess is that they probably introduced the copy deduction candidate to make this case work. 
And then this kind of fell out as a consequence and it was not noticed until much later when people discovered this. This is what I guess probably has happened based on similar things I have seen happening on the committee. Alternately, they, somebody knew about it and they decided that this was less important than making T1 work. Yes, and I think actually this is true. So Marshall's comment was maybe someone did notice this, but then they decided consciously that actually this is less bad than making this work. And I think it's really important that this works because it would be a lot more surprising if this didn't work. So the takeaway here is, I guess, just remember this rule that uh, basically the copy deduction candidate always wins. Right, so now we're done. We, we have discussed all the rules. Yes? For the case of copying the same type, uh, you go back to the uh, This. Uh, the, the question was, we have auto for that, why do you insist on making that work? I don't know. Um, I mean, but it would be inconsistent if it, that wouldn't work, would it? This is the way it works. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And a console function, I want this to at least be a vector of some sort, mm. uh, not just willy nilly auto <laughs> coming out of it. Yeah. So. so the comment was you want to explicitly restrict this to this template, and this is why you see that in the first place. So, it, yeah, it kind of makes sense. Okay, so we now discuss the rules. This is the actual wording, and none of this should surprise you by now. You should be able to read this and understand everything that's going on here, uh, because this is literally what we just discussed. Okay, now. We're done with, this is C++ 17. Um, now we come to C++ 20. So this is uh, the paper uh, proposing some changes or some additions for C++ 20. And as I said, um, it's not officially voted in yet because there's still some fixes we need to do to the wording, but I'm fairly certain this will happen at the next meeting in Cologne. Um, so yeah, this is what we're gonna get in 20 basically. Um, and this adds so as I said, CTAD kind of was added um, quite late in the recycle for 17, so some things were just, I guess there was not enough time to cover all the cases that you wanted to cover, so now we're doing it in 20. Um, and then this has um, basically three parts. So in CTAD 20 you get CTAD for aggregates, which is kind of what I was mainly working on. Um, then CTED for alias templates, for which Richard Smith uh, came up with a really clever algorithm that I will describe. And then um, CTED from inherited constructors, which is uh, Mike's work. Um, so this is kind of the three things that we're going to get in 20. Um, let's discuss all of them. CTED for aggregates. So, so I said like I, I did this work of like implementing uh, CTED in, in JetBrains C++ front end. And then I kind of uh, also discussed it with people and people kind of talked to me about how they use CTAD. And then certain things kept coming up as like, this is surprising, this should work. And one of those things is this, where if you have an aggregate, uh, uh, like a template which is an aggregate and you want to do aggregate initialization on it, that doesn't work. And, and people repeatedly said, this is surprising. Um, because this is so simple, right? It's just aggregate initialization. It's totally obvious what should be happening here. Why does this not work? Uh, and the good news, so, so, so one thing that we had to teach in C++ 17 is like this rule that whenever you have an aggregate, aggregates always need explicit deduction guides. So in C++ 17, you would have to write this really stupid deduction guide, which just takes the arguments and deduces the same arguments. Um, so the rule was aggregates always need explicit guides, uh, which is kind of annoying because it doesn't add any information. It's kind of noise. So, and it also surprises people. So, the good news is in CS20, you don't need to do that because this is going to be synthesized for you. So, this will work. And then, um, back in CS17, what would happen if you would write this? Again, exercise whether you remember how CTAT works. What would happen here if you would do this um, in CS17? It doesn't compile, okay, what's the error? No, no constructor with those parameters. No constructor with those parameters, exactly. So the error would be no matching constructor for aggregate pair in bool. So CTAT would succeed, right? Remember, so 
CTAT doesn't call anything. CTAT looks at um, the initializer you wrote. Uh, it's going to see that there is a guide which matches this. Deduction will succeed. You're going to get aggregate pair and bool, and then it would do, oh, but you wrote parens. You're doing direct initialization. There's no constructor. You need to use curlies. If you don't use curlies, this, this will not succeed. And the good news is that in CSS20, this will compile too, because thanks to this other paper on aggregate initialization, uh, P0960, um, initializing aggregates from parenthesized lists of values, this will work. So the other, I'm not going to talk about this in detail here because this talk is not about that, but basically in CSS20, you will be able to do aggregate initialization with, with parents, both for aggregate types, class types, and also for arrays. So this will just work. Does it work for in place as well? Uh, what do you mean? No, no, no. So, so this will not call initializer list constructors. So it, this will not. If you, if you had a vector of aggregate pair. If you had a vector of aggregate pair. And then you did vector dot in place. The yes, one. this is the whole point. Why, why did, why did we do this? Why does this paper exist? Because um, uh, in C++ 17, you cannot implement things like in place or things like uh, uh, like any kind of perfect forwarding thing, like make unique, you cannot implement them for aggregates, right? They're, not, they're unimplementable for aggregates because aggregates don't work with the syntax and curlies don't really work in templates. So this is the fix for that. This is the primary motivation for this paper, that you can use in place with aggregates in C++20, yes. But then the consequence is that this also will work, which is kind of nice. So how does this work? Um, and then basically, so what we need to decide, so we want to synthesize this thing, right? We need to decide, is this an aggregate? Is this an aggregate? No, it's not, because it's not a class. It's a class template. Argu aggregates are either arrays or classes. This is not a class, it's a class template. So how do we decide? So um, in C++ 20, we have these rules. So uh, we have um, this other paper, which was, by the way, really hard to get through the committee, which simplifies um, the rules for what an aggregate is, uh, which is, again, not important here. But basically, these are the rules we're going to get in 20, what an aggregate is. Um, and so do these rules apply to this thing? So what you end up doing is you end up asking yourself, could, like, I mean, it doesn't have any of these, 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 so yeah, probably fine. What about this one? Depends. Depends. You can't tell. Yeah. Are you going to synthesize the, uh, the deduction guide or not? So what we ended up doing is, um, in order to do this, we're going to say, okay, this, is this template is potentially aggregate. You know, so we're going to just apply these rules, which are not meant to be used on templates. We're going to apply them to this template, and we're going to see if they're true, and we're going to ignore dependent base classes, because in this case, we can't tell. Right? So this would be a potentially aggregate template, and, and this would also be a potentially aggregate template. And then, and then what, what's going on? So how, how are we going to synthesize this guide? So we're going to say, what are the elements of this? If this were an aggregate, which it is not because it's a template, but if it were an aggregate, what are the elements? So we know what the elements of an aggregate are. So we're just going to synthesize the deduction guide, which, um, which I call the aggregate deduction candidate. Um, and it's going to take the elements of the aggregate and it's going to use them as um, uh, parameters, and then it's going to deduce the um, template with those parameters. So it's going to literally synthesize the thing that you would otherwise have write manually. So this is what's going to happen, and, and this is how it works. There's a few um, gotchas here. You can't really use brace elision, so this is something that you can normally do with aggregates. It, but brace elision is basically happens if you have nested sub-aggregates, but because it's a template, like T, you don't know whether T is an aggregate, right? So you don't know whether this has sub-aggregates. So you wouldn't be able to do brace elision because you don't know, 
you know, base elision kind of recurses down into the sub aggregates bit, but you can't do that here because you don't know whether T or U are aggregates. So no base elision in this case. Base elision will not work. Uh, and the other thing is that you have to correctly initialize uh, the elements that don't have initializers, right? Remember, aggregate initialization, if you have three elements, you only write two initializers, the third one is going to be value initialized. Um, so this needs to work as well. So for example, if you have a third thing here, which is an int, so you don't have to deduce it, but you don't write this in there, you don't initialize it. You want this int to be initialized to zero. Um, so the guide, guide that you actually have to um, synthesize is something like this. And this is, uh, so I had, um, I wrote some wording doing essentially this for um, Kona. And then basically the reason this didn't get in is because there was another edge case where instead of an int, you might have something that's actually not default constructible, but it might have a direct member initializer. And then you actually need here, you need the direct member initializer from here to be put there. And I couldn't figure out how to word this correctly. So this is basically the reason why I need to solve this for Cologne. I don't, I'm not sure yet how to do this. If anyone wants to help me, please. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I think it's going to be fine. It's just wordsmithing, which I'm not particularly good at. Um, um, so aggregates, great. Um, the second, so any questions about aggregates? So this is just going to work, basically. Yeah, cool. Second case is um, CTAT for alias templates. And I think this is the one that, that people really, really want. I heard this from several people, including the talk just before the lunch break. Um, um, so if you have um, an alias, like this one here, like the PMR vector, then this doesn't work. And this is very sad. And in C++ 20, so, so you have to actually write the type here. And in C++ 20, this will work. Uh, and here's another example from the talk just before the lunch break. Um, who was in this talk by Mat Mateusz? Yeah, so, so you have seen this code then. So he has this uh, unit library, and, and he found it very frustrating that if you have um, this kind of gener generic quantity template, and then you have this template alias, which is like describes like a length, so, you, you, so what aliases typically do is they take the template parameters and they're going to fix a subset of these parameters to something, right? And the others will still be uh, kind of template parameters. But then CTAT uh, uh, doesn't work in 17. In 20, it will work thanks to this uh, addition. So here, if you do units length, it, it, will, it will do the right thing, right? So if you give it an int, it's going to go into the alias template, and then it's going to use... Uh, Dimension length is going to use u, meter, and rep, it's going to use whatever you gave it because that's the thing that the constructor takes. So you're going to get this. If you go to double, you're going to get a double. So, so this will work. Um, how does this work exactly? So this is this uh, very clever algorithm uh, which Richard Smith came up with. I'm, I hope I'm going, to describe, I'm going to be able to describe it correctly. So how... how can we make this work? So let's take a simpler example, which is, um, again, you have a pair, and then let's say you fix the first uh, template argument, and then you're going to leave the second one. Um, and then what you want is, if you, if you initialize one of those, and you use CTAD, so the first one is obviously an int, and then the second one, you still want the second one to be deduced to const char sign. So how does this work? Okay, first of all, the, the fact that it's an alias template doesn't, change the constructor signatures, right? And the deduction guide signatures. So we are still looking at the same constructors and the same deduction guides as the normal pair. So we can still find the correct deduction guide, which is this one. This is going to be the deduction guide they're going to be using. This is like pair has literally this deduction guide. Now, obviously this doesn't work because, um, you know, if we just use this, then maybe we end up with something different. So like imagine if this were a double, we would deduce double here, but we want to not deduce anything for this one because we already said here that it's an int. So how do we do that? We pick the right deduction guide, and then it's a three-step algorithm. So first, the first thing that we're going to do is we, if we have this deduction guide, we're going to take the, um, uh, the type alias, and we're going to deduce the return type using this type alias in here. So we basically, we're going to take the, the type alias definition, and we're going to put it in here, right? So we're just going to put this down here. This is the first step. The second step is, now that we have this, 
you're going to substitute it back into the rest of the deduction guide. This is like the complicated step. So we take the alias and we substitute it back in. So what do we do? We replace t by int and u by x. So we're going to do the same transformation on the whole thing. And then we have this, right? So we replaced t by int, so it just goes away, and we replace u by x everywhere. So this is the second step. And then the third step is, now that we have this deduction guide, we're going to just rewrite it in terms of the, um, the, the, um, the alias template. And then we're done. And this is the deduction guide that we're going to synthesize. And then we have this, we have this deduction guide. Hey, deduction succeeds. It uses the correct thing. Um, we're done. So we're going to get this in, in 20. And I hope this is going to be useful. Um, question. Can one write this deduction line in Python right now? Or is it no. Right now, you cannot write this deduction guide. Because in C++ at all, because in C++ 17, the grammar says that this thing has to be a template name. And this is not a template name, this is a template alias name. So this would be a hard, like, parser error. But it will be valid in 20? Uh, yes, but, the, well, no, well, in 20, this will be synthesized for you. I know, but if you write it explicitly. You, can't, you still will not be able to write okay. explicit deduction guides for aliases, but you, this is going to happen for you. Yeah? Okay. Um, so now coming back to um, Mateusz's uh, um, code here. So one thing that he mentioned in his talk, for those of you who were there, so he was sad that um, basically this works in 20, this is fine. Um, but then if you, if you just um, kind of specify the first template argument, so let's say instead of meters you want miles because we're in America, um, then all of a sudden the, the third one changes from int to double. This is what's going to happen in 20. Should we, uh, does everyone see why this is the case? So in the first one, you're going to do CTAD the way I just described. So you're going to synthesize the deduction guide, do CTAD, you're going to deduce this. In the, in the second case, you wrote this, so this is not a placeholder type, right? So this is not going to do any CTAD. What it's going to do is it's going to just take the alias. It's going to say, well, okay, so u is mile, and then this has a default argument, so I'm going to use double here, and this is dimension length, so it's going to, to use this. And this is kind of, uh, uh, some people think it's a weird inconsistency. I don't think this is a weird inconsistency. Consider this, if you would just write angle, angle, you would also get double, right? So this gives something different from this just by adding angle, angle here. And the reason is, of course, you only get CTAD when you don't have angle angle. So only when you don't have any template argument list at all, do you have, only then you have a placeholder, and only then does any of this happen. So as long as you remember that as soon as you have angle angle, there's no CTAD, this actually makes perfect sense. Uh, yes? If you make a template alias, miles, that is unit length miles number five. Yes. Well, if you, have, if you have another template alias, then it would have another name. It would not be length. You would have to give it another name, right? Yes, miles, for example. Yeah. But this would still be a template alias. Yes. But it would do C tag then and would deduce the function. So as soon as you don't write angle angle, it will do C tag, yes. So without angle angle, um, without C tag, a uh, template alias will not compile. Right? If you have a template alias, you still have to do angle angle in C14. Otherwise, it's going to say, well. No, I'm, I'm asking about 20. In tw well, yeah, so what's the question? If I make a template alias for this unit length miles. If you make a template alias using length in miles and then you and then teach replace the this number. by mile. But then it has a different name, right? Yeah. So it's going to be called length in miles. Yes. Okay, and now you're going to use it here? Yeah. Well, because you have this, you're not going to get any CTAD. And then it's going well, to deduce so miles, length, and, and double. Then write without the brackets. 
If you write it without the brackets, you can get CTAD, and then you're going to get mile, uh, length, mile, uh, int, because you wrote an int here. Uh, Victoria? How much of a concern is the breaking change? Uh, the comment was, is that a breaking change? And the answer is, it's not a breaking change, because it's not, as soon as you have angle, angle, you don't get CTAD, so nothing changes for this case. But in the first case, when you have all the arguments you could hold Yes. In C17, this will not compile because this is not a template name. Oh, okay. So none of this is breaking. None of any of the stuff is breaking any code. In 17, the compiler will say, this is not a template name. I'm not, I can't pass this. It's literally like the grammar doesn't allow it. It's not even CTAD. It's like the grammar literally doesn't allow it. Oh, hang on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that needs template arguments in 17. In 20, it doesn't, because we're basically introducing another placeholder. So template alias name without angle brackets can now be also a template, uh, a placeholder. Okay, so we don't have that much time left. So the third one is CTAP from inherited constructor. And okay, let's go to the super simple case again. So this is obvious, CTAD works, right? We all know this, it's going to deduce widget int. Now, as an implementation detail, you know, you want to do something like this where you have a base class which defines the constructor and then you're gonna, you know, just kind of inherit those constructors. <coughs> and then, in 17, CTAD will break because this doesn't have any constructors and doesn't look into the base class. So in C20, we're gonna fix that as well. Um, and what this does is, as soon as you have this line, as soon as you inherit the constructors of your base class, you're, you're going to get all of its deduction guides as well, including the explicit ones. Okay. Which means that this is always going to, whether you have this base class or not, basically the user doesn't have to care, CTAD will work the same way, which is finally consistent behavior. Um, and then, uh, so this is the simple case, the more complicated case is if you're inheriting from a specialization of it or like a partial specialization where you have some stuff that you, ha that you fix and some stuff that, you, mm -hmm. that is still a template parameter. And in this case, it will fall back to the algorithm I described for aliases. So it's going to do the substitute back and then deduce. So the same arg algorithm will apply here as well. This is a question how, how, how this works, basically. Well, at the point of instantiation, it will decide what, what the base class is, and then depending on that, it's going to uh, inherit the constructors of that base class. It might be a specialization. But, but during CTAD, you don't know what key is. You don't know which specialization of which is based. Like, there has to be a parameter to find the similar key. Well, Okay, so, so it will look into the primary template of the thing that you wrote. No, and then, oh, oh, so you're saying whether it will, okay, whether if this has a specialization of int, right. which doesn't have any constructors, whether the CTAD will go that route or whether it will go the primary template route. And I don't think we discussed this in core. I, I would think it would, <laughs> it would have to go to the primary template because it doesn't know what it is. Yeah, so it has to go to the primary template. I'm pretty sure we did not discuss this. <coughs> so, uh, okay, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, or maybe we did, and I, I like, I, uh, the wording for this is not obvious. And, and I did not write this bit, so this is uh, Richard and Mike, so. So you, sh you should call it to their attention. Um, so yeah. Okay, we thought of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, cool. Um, more work for Cologne, thank you. Um, so yeah, this is basically CDAT is plus 20. Um, any questions? Yes? I have a question, sort of long time. But so, the, so we see that here, I tried to find a way to do this in the actual running. And if you bring the example from that, it looks like just convenience for the user. But accidentally, I found 
and you should be fortunate for running. Is that, I'm nobody who can speak, I don't know if it's an action of implementation or not, but if you have a template template class in your template parameters, then these reduction rules work also. Maybe, can you answer this? <laughs> I, I have not tried this. I, I well, it works. I mean, when I tried for the first time, I, I think it worked in CLang and not in GCC, and now it works in both. But I don't know if it's by accident. I, maybe it's like an emergent feature. I don't know. I mean, you, if you just follow the syntax, it seems that it should work, and it works. I'm pretty sure this was not the yeah. intention why CTAD was introduced. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I, I can't really comment on this. Um, it's, it's an interesting property, I guess, which, is it useful? Have you found it to be useful? Well, it's elegant. So if, if you have like std vector as your parameter without any decoration, yeah, yeah. then, and that's uh, your template template class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you use b, you know, lowercase b equals something. Mm -hmm. It just uses bubble or whatever. So you can use it as some kind of meta function yeah, thing, exactly. as a building block in like meta yeah, function no, stuff. This is really cool. I don't think this was intentional. I think it's kind of a, it falls out of it. Yeah, this is really cool. Okay, yeah, I've not, I've not done any of the stuff myself, so I'm not the expert here, but it's really cool to know that you can do these things. But then you are dependent on reduction rules to be, you know, pretty elegant. Yeah, 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 cool. I think, you, did you say you did something like this? Like you did stuff with CTAD? You, you mentioned CTAD in your talk, didn't you? I used CTAD for both templates, but also for Oh, but not as like a, a meta function. Okay. Interesting stuff. Yeah, let's talk about this later. Sure. So we have a few more slides and a few more minutes. So this is where we come to the uh, unicorns and traps section. Yeah. I think he jumped the gun with the unicorns. Sorry? I think he jumped the gun with the unicorns. He, he gave you a unicorn before you got to your unicorn section. Well, no, this is not the unicorn because it's already a thing. It actually exists and actually works. So it's not the unicorn, it's just very cool. <laughs> <laughs> Unicorns don't exist, <laughs> as far as I know. So, so, so the first one is... Um, Maybe this is rough, right? <laughs> um, so ba ba back to this. Um, and so this works in, in, in a declaration like this. Uh, it doesn't work um, if you put it on a return type or if you, put, if you put it in a parameter declaration. And I find this unfortunate because, well, it works with auto. And since C++20, thanks to like a, byproduct of, a byproduct of concepts, you can also have auto parameters and functions now. So this works, this works, but the CDAT version doesn't work. And I find that really unfortunate. Some people say, well, it's not kind of, it's kind of not the same thing because, you know, auto, like concepts is all about constraining things, whereas CTED is more about constructing things. But my counter argument is, or initializing things. <coughs> but my counter argument is, well, if you return something by value or if you pass something as an argument, you're literally initializing something, right? So passing or returning is literally copy initialization. It's not different from writing rigid w equals something. Mm -hmm. Not really. Or a copy assignment. Or like, yeah, whatever. Like, however you use this. But this is not, so I don't see a reason why CTED should not work here. And actually, I heard from other people that they accept, expected that to work, and it didn't. And, and kind of the unfortunate thing here is that the very first version of this paper, um, uh, where they were like, so, so Mike had like, I think, 12 different things that, that he wanted to ha added, be added to CTAD. And this was one of them. And then we discussed this in Rapperswil and, and it kind of fell through the cracks. Like I looked up the, the, the meeting notes afterwards and there was some discussion where someone said, well, if you would be able to do this and then you would have different return statements that, you know, return different specializations of the template. Like you could write ugly code, but like this same, holds for auto and this, like it's not so different from any of these so and and there wasn't a poll on this or anything so it kind of was a it kind of fell through the cracks and uh, I'm I'm I find this is sad because I think this would make a lot of sense and actually I heard from people like they would expect it to work and it doesn't so maybe you know we should just propose this again except unfortunately the ship has pretty much sailed for 20 so but yeah 
Lambdas, lambdas in C++11 did a few things. 14 did more. 17 did more. Um, so CCAD, CCAD in 17 did some things. You do it some more in 20. You can do more in 20. Okay, so I'm going to literally write this up and just propose it again and see what happens. Um, okay, cool. Because like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not the guy who would like come up with like great new language features. This is not, there's not many like more clever people than me who do this kind of stuff. But what kind of my thing is, it annoys me if it's like inconsistent, hard to teach, hard to understand. And, and there's like these unexpected things. So I try to kind of fix these things to like make it nicer and more to like what people expect, how people expect to be able to use these features. So this is like one of those, this would be one of those consistency fixes essentially. Um, Vittorio. Okay, so this is basically the same. Disc so, so Victoria's comment was, this would implicitly create a template. So basically, we're back to the discussion why we have to have this order here, why we can't just write set widget w concept, which was like this very, very long and torturous mm -hmm. discussion in the committee over the last few years. So, yes, uh, probably. Let's think about this. Um, I'll definitely have another think about this. Um, yeah, it's a valid, valid comment. Um, yeah, let's let's discuss it. Um, but um, yeah, so this is an error. This is unfortunate. But this is kind of um, kind of a consistency thing. But this is not like the, the big unicorn. The big unicorn here is this one, which is what we discussed this morning in Mateusz's talk a little bit, and what I heard a lot of people uh, kind of say is that why is it that function template argument deduction works on incomplete template argument lists. So this is actually the one use we still have for make tuple and make pair and all these functions. So function template argument deduction works the way that you can uh, you know, specify one template argument and it's still going to deduce the others. Whereas CTED, as we already discussed five times today, only does anything if you don't have any argument list at all. So why does this work and this doesn't. Why does this not say, okay, well, you specified int, so I'm gonna use int for this one, and then I'm still gonna use CTAD on these two. This obviously doesn't work. This is not gonna compile in 17 or 20 or ever. Um, but like, this would be nice, right? So, so, so then you could write this, where you have like an array, and you wanna say, okay, I want an array of ints, but I don't wanna write the size. I want that to be deduced. Or like, if you have a set, you can say like, well, I want to fix the uh, element type, but I don't want to, like, I want to deduce the uh, type of this comparator here. So there's quite a few cases where this would be useful. Um, let, me, let me explain now why we can never, ever get this and why it's a good thing. Um, so there's quite, and this was probably your question, right? There's like many reasons why this is a bad idea and why I really hope we will never get this. And I'm pretty sure we'll never get this because evolution already shut it down. This was one of the, re one of the rare occasions where you work on something, you, 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 you kind of propose it, and then people shoot it down, and then you're really happy this happened because they pointed things out to you that you didn't know. And then you're like, okay, you wanted this, but then actually everyone convinced you that it's a terrible idea, so now you're happy that you're not going to get this. And this is exactly one of those cases. This is a terrible idea. And um, why? So there's a number of reasons. First reason is, OK, let's say we have this. Is this a placeholder type? We don't know. So this affects the grammar. This is like, are you going to do CTED? What can you write? Like, can you, like, um, and, and, and so if we allow CTED from incomplete template argument lists, the definition of a placeholder type is going to be a lot more complicated because currently it's auto decal type auto, a concept name auto, or a template name with no angle brackets or a template alias name with no angle brackets. All of a sudden now here you would have to look into, like do a lot more complicated logic to even figure out whether this is a placeholder or not. So this is already getting very, very complicated. I mean, this is still kind of doable in, in the kind of simple cases, right? So if you have, um, you know, a struct that takes two uh, template arguments and then you only specify one, there's nothing else, then obviously, you know, this is a placeholder in this case. 
this is kind of the easy case. But what happens if you have this? So is now this a placeholder type? Is this a complete or an incomplete template argument list? <coughs> right? You have to choose. You don't know. There's no right answer. You have to choose. If you say it is, you're instantly going to break code. You could say ambiguous. Well, OK. So if you say it is, this breaks instantly, right? Because currently tuple can have this like second argument, which is the allocator. But then if this can be an incomplete thing and you're going to use theta, then you're going to use, instead of a tuple int, you're going to use a tuple int allocator int. So this literally breaks code. So you can't do this. You could say it's ambiguous, or you could say, we're not going to do this for variadic templates. That's like the even easier solution. OK, if you have variadic templates, not going to do this. But there's another case. Yeah. Well, if you have, um, if you have a default uh, argument here, is this a placeholder? We have to, again, it's not clear. We have to decide yes or no. If we say yes, again, you break existing code. And it gets actually even worse. So let's say you're back to this easy case. And you say, OK, all these special cases, we're going to discard them. We're not going to use CTAD on any of these cases. Either we're going to say, as you said, it's ambiguous, and then we're going to error out, or we're just not going to do any CTAD at all. So we only allow it for this very, very simple case. So this is going to deduce widget in bool. What happens now? Let's say you're a library implementer. You ship this. Uh, well, not the, like some library, not the standard library, some library. You ship this. And then in version 2 of your library, you add a default uh, template parameter. That's just a common thing, right? So you just kind of simplify things. Uh, you know, have like additional, simpler ways of, of and, and now this becomes a break, like introducing this in widget version 2.0 becomes a breaking change. Because now just by doing this, you're turning a placeholder type into a complete type, and then you're going to turn this to this. So your users are going to be deducing a different type just because you introduced this default argument here. So this would be a breaking change. Yes? Another breaking change would be temp type, template type name T, type name U, class equals enable if blue. Yes. You add an enable this in if, um, condition in the, te the template type <coughs> list. So Marshall's comment is if you add a third, if you don't do this, but instead you add a third argument, which is like enable if to sfine out some cases, which is common, um, then you're also going to break your user's code because they're going to deduce another type. So for all of these reasons, no. This is, is not a thing, will never be a thing. Um, basically, the rule is, OK, let's take questions first. Uh, one, two, three. The, um, maybe the we have one minute left. The solution would be to say, um, if a template argument list contains a placeholder, the whole thing becomes a placeholder. And then you could write like, okay, so in, comma, auto. we have one minute left. So unfortunately, I think we need That's to. We, we need to discuss this after the talk because we have one minute left. So let me just say, this is not a thing. You can never make this work. Just remember, knowingly brackets, you get CTAD. Angry brackets, you don't get CTAD. You know, as long as you remember this, CTAD is your friend and everything is good. <laughs> Thank you.